Yes, here is our uh, webinar on how to write a strong grade or standing appeal. So it's brought to you by uh, your students unions, the Ryerson Students Union and CSER, which is the Continuing Education Students Association of Ryerson. Um, so um, I will get going to the next slide here. Um, we're going to acknowledge the land that we're on. Um, so we can never work to end systemic and institutional violence if we do not center the narratives of indigenous peoples. As settlers on Turtle Island, uh, we directly benefit from the colonization and genocide of the indigenous peoples of this land. In order to engage in resistance and solidarity against the injustices inflicted on indigenous folks, it is imperative that we constantly work on acts of decolonization. So that being said, uh, Toronto and the university uh, are in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that brought them together to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations uh, and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Okay, so now we'll uh, go on to introduce ourselves. I'll go first. Um, my name is Lyndall Musselman. I'm uh, the Student Rights Coordinator for CSER. Um, so that's the Students Union that uh, represents all Chang School students and students in part-time undergraduate degree uh, programs at Ryerson. And over to you, Jose. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Gonzalez. I'm like Lindo. I work for the union. I work for the rise uh, for the rise and uh, the RSU, Ryerson Student Union. So I see uh, we assist all um, full time and graduate students along with my colleagues uh, Carolina, who is here, and Suli, and I will pass it on to them. Um, okay, I'll go first. So um, my name is Carlina. Like Jose said, um, I'm a student issues and advocacy assistant. So um, if you reach out to the RSU advocacy, um, myself and Zoli will be the first people you talk to. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Zoli. Hey everyone, my name is Zoli. Uh, along with Jose, Carolina, I work for the Rising Students Union as the Student Issues and Advocacy Assistant. Just to add on to Jose and Carolina, what they already mentioned, when you do reach out to us, all your cases are really confidential. Uh, it only stays within our office. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to Carolina. Hi, so a little bit about what we as advocates and advocates advocate assistants do is we assist kind of with three main issues as well as we do help with additional academic related things on the side but we help with grade and standing appeals as we're going to be discussing today um, we also help with academic misconduct issues so if you get any um, citations for academic misconduct um, on anything you can reach out to um, to any of us and we will help you out with that um, and then any other academic advocacy that might come up, um, things like fee appeals um, or human rights issues, we'll work with the human rights office to address those things. So if you are um, a full-time graduate or undergraduate student, you would reach out to us through the RSU. And then if you are a part-time or continuing education student, then you would reach out to Lyndall with CSER. And I will pass it on to Lyndall. Thank you. So goals and the goal of this workshop. Um, we're hoping to uh, enable you um, to determine if you're appealing um, just a grade um, from the past semester from winter 2021 or your academic standing. So being um, required to withdraw or permanently program withdraw um, or potentially do both of those types of appeal as in the grade appeal and um, a standing appeal. Um, so we're going to explain how to solve um, problems that you've encountered informally by talking with your instructor for the course or maybe your chair director of the teaching department or your home program. 
Um, we'll go over some tips and hints uh, for writing your appeal statement and how to gather important supporting documents to strengthen your appeal. And just, of course, be aware that there is a deadline that is uh, a week from yesterday, uh, Tuesday, May 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, in Ryerson time. <laughs> Over to Zoe. Thank you. So I'll be talking about why you should uh, appeal. All right. So there's uh, many reasons to do an appeal. Uh, I'll be just going over uh, the university's grade and standing appeal process available for the students. Uh, one could be when students, uh, when something unexpected happens that impacts your academics, a situation beyond your control that was unforeseen or made it difficult for you to succeed academically. Number two could be when the university policies are not followed and negatively impact you uh, as a result. So this could be uh, the professor or the course instructor changes the weight of the final exam last minute. And then lastly, you disagree with the new standing based on valid grounds of uh, appeal, which is course management and prejudice. We'll be talking more in detail about course management, prejudice, and all these grounds later in this presentation. I'll pass it over to Jose now. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Um, sorry, I'm just, I was just trying some notes. Um, just give me one second, everyone. Uh, I'm just sending um, just saying a message to everyone with the appeal information package. Uh, sorry, Sully, I got lost. Which slide is that? It's number six. Okay, good, good. Sorry, it's number, sorry, just give me one second just to go to the slide. Good. Uh, yeah, so filing a gray on standing appeal is, is, is very stressful. I mean, every time that we put, uh, we present this workshop, I just, I just like to see that picture because it's, it's how, you know, we all feel at the end of the semester, um, especially now under these present times uh, with the COVID and with a lot of stress and anxiety, everything is building up and um, I don't blame you. So, and especially those students that they feel like, oh my goodness, I got this gray and that's not fair. Um, I, was, I was sick, I was dealing with this, uh, family matter or something happened in the exam, I wasn't able to deal, uh, or the policy, I receive a grade that doesn't really reflect and what I want to do, this is not fair. So it's very stressful navigating uh, the policy, especially when this is your first time. So um, this is very common uh, for students just to file a great appeal and we will talk more about that. But just, just for you to know, uh, we are here, uh, CSER uh, and, and RSU, uh, we are your advocates. We will do everything that we can uh, to support you through, through the appeal process. And again, uh, yes, it is stressful. It seems like uh, there will be a lot of information. Uh, at the end of the day, this workshop, it will be just for you, just, just to make things easier. We will just be talking about policy, policy 168, which is about the policy that are relevant for us appeals. And again, so we are here with you. I, I know you feel like the person that is like, you know, probably right, uh, like in the, in the picture, but uh, at the end of the, of the workshop, hopefully you, you feel much better. And that's, that's kind of the, the, our goal. Okay, so before we launch into how to do a grade and standing appeal, we like to just discuss informal resolutions. And I know for a lot of you, this might feel like a little bit too late or uh, only a little, but too late. Um, but it's important to discuss informal resolutions if this issue ever arises for you again, but also because it's really important that you address this in your standing um, and grade appeal letters. So um, an informal resolution is to try to resolve the situation informally um, without a formal appeal. So this could mean speaking with your instructor or your professor um, about any issues that you've had in the course. If an extenuating circumstance arises, like a family member passes away, Way, or you have a traumatic experience in your life or anything like that, it's um, if you can 
explain the situation to your professor ahead of time um, or have a discussion with them before your final grades are released on RAMS, they have a lot more leeway, um, which allows them to kind of um, go around the informal, the formal process. Um, and it can be a lot easier to find a resolution that you as a student are comfortable with and that your professor and instructor is comfortable with. Um, so if something like this happens in the future, um, it's very important that you kind of go through this step first before waiting to get your very final grades at the end of the semester. That said, if any of you who are listening did go through those formal cha um, channels, those informal channels and have spoken with your professor or your instructor, make sure you highlight that in your standing and grade appeals. Make sure you include screenshots from conversations or PDFs of your emails in order to highlight that you did go through this channel. Um, uh, it's, it's very important, especially if they weren't able to help you, but to show that you took every step necessary. And if you didn't speak with a professor or an instructor or the chair of your program, um, just explain why not. And that, and a lot of the time that can be as simple as you not knowing that you had that ability to speak with your professor or that you didn't feel comfortable discussing these issues. Um, but you should include in your, in your grade or standing appeal somewhere why you didn't discuss these issues with your, um, your professor or instructor sooner. So that's just a little bit about informal resolution. We'll get more into how to integrate that and other things into your letter later on. Um, but now I will pass it back to Jose. Before we just go and talk about uh, appeals, right? Again, we, there's only two types of academics appeals, uh, the great appeal and the standing appeal. So again, we want to be focusing today on those mainstream academic, uh, great and standing. So um, the great, if you have any issues uh, with, a, with, a, with a particular course, I mean, and then you will be, great appeals focus more in a course uh, with the final grade with a course. I mean, you can file multiple great appeals. So if you fail, uh, if you have uh, some issues, and we will talk about the grounds of appeals when I say some issues. If you, there were some occurrences uh, and then affect you different uh, courses, then you will need to file either one or more appeals. So basically, gray appeal. So you file, you can file one gray appeal per course that you fail. Uh, and then if you have um, academic standing issues, uh, such as RTW, PPW, then you can uh, consider just filing and standing appeal. So those are the two streams, uh, the two, two, uh, five, two types of appeal that you need to keep in mind and policies. 168 talks, the great appeal, and then standing appeal. And now I will just pass it on to Lindo so you, he can tell you more about those um, appeals. Thank you. So why not submit both appeals? Um, it may seem like a lot of work. It may seem cumbersome in a way. However, it can be worth your while. Um, so like we really actually do want to encourage you if you are um, you know, in a position where you disagree with being required to withdraw or permanently program withdraw, and especially program withdraw permanently, like PBW, really think about definitely appealing your standing. Um, and because, and the grade that led you to fall into that academic standing, um, because if, if you're, you submit the grade appeal and a standing appeal or possibly multiple grade appeals and a standing appeal, Great appeals are supposed to and usually are considered first. Um, and um, that's a good thing because um, if you're granted your great appeal and for example, are offered an opportunity to maybe write that final exam that you unfortunately had to miss um, or are granted like a reweighting of um, the components for your course in question um, and you are able to end up passing that course, it can clear up and correct your academic standing issue. Um, so that can be really important, especially if you happen to be a student that maybe is PPW due to failing a required course a third time, or if you happen to be in nursing and uh, failed a required course um, that second time and become PPW, um, definitely consider doing both a great appeal and the standing appeal. Um, and so if things are resolved through your grade appeal, then your standing appeal becomes like moot, like it's done, like a, it, it's just resolved. So yeah, just a big tip on that um, point. 
And on to Carlina. Hi, so just um, one additional point when it comes to standing appeals. Um, and it's an important reminder is that while you're going through the process of appealing your standing, you still have the right to enroll in courses um, while your standing appeal is under consideration. And not only courses, but any um, Ryerson um, programs that you pay for with your fees, like counseling or anything like that, you're entitled to those services while your appeal is being considered. So um, if you want to enroll in classes um, while your standing appeal is being um, appealed, just consult with your program rep um, and ask to be manually enrolled. Sometimes the like Ryerson, um, you know, program online will like note that your, your standing is being reviewed. So you can't automatically sign up for classes like other students can, but just reach out. They can manually enroll you um, and you continue can continue on in your courses. And the same is true for any other Ryerson services. Um, if you're told that you can't receive counseling, you can just inform them that you know you're, you're, um, it's under appeal and that you still have the right to access those resources. So, um, so you, you can be removed from your courses if your appeal is unsuccessful. So if you're going through the appeal process and it doesn't go the way that you want, then you can be removed. But up until that point, you have the full ability to enroll in courses and use any other Ryerson services. Um, so um, it's also important to note though, that you won't be able to enroll in courses where you've not completed the prerequisites, um, just like any other time. So again, this is only for those who file standing appeals who have the right to enroll in courses while their appeal is under consideration. Awesome, so now we're going on to Zully. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I'll be talking about grounds for appeal. Uh, there are four grounds for appeal uh, under the Ryerson University's Policy 168, the grade and standing appeal, which outlines your valid grounds or reasons, you could say, for filing a grade or standing appeal, which could be extenuating circumstances, procedural error, prejudice, and course management. Course management you could only do this for uh, grade appeals only, not standing appeals. And we'll be just talking more in detail in the following slides about extenuating circumstances, procedural error prejudice and course management. I'll pass it over to Erin, uh, who's here from the Human Rights Office, who will be talking about prejudice uh, appeal and uh, what her office uh, human rights uh, basically does. Just before Aaron um, touches on prejudice, I just wanted to flag in case there are any graduate students uh, present um, that you actually can appeal course management grounds on that basis for academic standing because of the nature of um, supervisory relationships. And if there were issues um, with um, yeah, being supervised through one of the like a um, milestone projects that graduate students have to work on. So for graduate students, you actually can use course management. Just wanted to flag that. It's sort of a, you know, a, a, a special situation for grad students. Sorry, on to prejudice grounds. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, as mentioned, my name's Erin and I'm a senior investigator with Human Rights Services here at Ryerson. And one of the unique things uh, about the prejudice ground in a grade appeal or a standing appeal is that there is another Ryerson policy uh, that also applies uh, if you're making claims of prejudice. And that policy is Ryerson's discrimination and harassment prevention policy. And so what happens if a student uh, checks the box or relies on the ground of prejudice in their greater standing appeal is that part of the appeal is carved out uh, and it is sent over to my office, to Human Rights Services, because we're the office responsible for reviewing any claims of discrimination or harassment that may be occurring uh, on the university campus or in relation to university activities. So we will uh, review that ground of prejudice under the discrimination and harassment prevention policy. So one of the things just to highlight for you when you're thinking about filing your appeal uh, is that I wanna be clear about what prejudice means. Uh, and so prejudice ultimately um, relates 
to a claim that you may have if you think that you have experienced some sort of differential treatment or disadvantage uh, when in receiving your grade or in receiving your standing um, that is re related to or connected to an aspect of your personal identity or, or personal characteristics. Uh, and one of those, and the personal identity uh, characteristic would have to be connected to what we call sort of protected grounds under the discrimination and harassment prevention policy. Uh, and so those sorts of protected grounds are things like uh, an individual's race, their sex, their uh, religion, their family status, their disability. Uh, so Ultimately, if you're filing a great appeal or standing appeal and considering whether to check off the ground of prejudice, uh, prejudice doesn't apply to general issues of unfairness or uh, general um, frustrations or challenges that you had with your course or your standing. Um, those might fall in, uh, into other grounds. But if you think the differential or, or treatment or the disadvantage you experience is related to an issue such as your sex, race, uh, or any combination of, of those types of grounds, then you may have a claim uh, that would fall under, under prejudice or under the discrimination and harassment prevention policy. So those are the types of things uh, that, that, that may lead you to check off the ground of prejudice. But even so, if you're not sure, uh, I would also welcome you to check in with our office before you decide to file your appeal um, to see if the type of issue that you that you're facing is is one uh, that may uh, that may be appropriate to bring to our office. So you can see our contact information there on the slide, um, and I will also put up uh, a link to the Human Rights Services website uh, in the chat um, because that has a lot more information as well about contacting our office uh, about the policies that we operate under and our different processes. So uh, please feel free to use us as a resource um, and we're happy to answer questions at any time uh, about what we do in general, but also the role that we play uh, with respect to prejudice grounds in grade and standing appeals. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Erin, just for the uh, wonderful introduction of the services. And yes, um, if you if you need to, um, the, the Office of the Human Rights is, is also confidential. And if you ever uh, want us just to be part or join uh, the appointments, you know, um, and the con I mean, I guess, as, as, as we know that everything you discuss with the Human Rights Office is confidential. But if you need our assistance from the advocates and you would like us just to um, um, be with you or support you, just, just let us know, but at the end, uh, they will just make the, their opinion um, and recommendations. Um, just to talk about the external circumstances, uh, that's, that's another uh, ground for both great and standing appeals. Uh, I guess this is a very common ground um, and, and it, it is, get listed or recognized in policy in the rights and policy 168. Um, if you're relying on this ground, basically it's a combination of health issues uh, or uh, compassionate issues. Uh, if you feel or, or if you believe uh, that your um, final mark uh, or your academic performance was directly impacted because um, uh, health issue or or, um, or a compassionate issue, which was beyond your control, and which was unforeseen, and as a result, that was the cause for you uh, to underperform, then uh, you will have a, a case just to rely on the external circumstances. If you can see there in the slide, they say A, B, C. Those are the subsections that policy 168 requires just for to meet the, the threshold for external uh, um, circumstances. Uh, so when you file your appeal, they will read the, the statement and then based on the information that you will provide, uh, the decision maker will be assessing whether your external circumstances follow that category. So it is important that uh, when you explain um, if you rely on the external circumstances that you keep in mind all these three subsections, A, B, and C. 
So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing that is important is that when you rely, and we, and we will be talking more about the evidence in, in, the, uh, in the further slides, uh, keep in mind that when every, every ground that you have uh, for appeal, you need to provide evidence and we'll be talking more about that. But if, if, for this one, it will be, it is recommended that if you can include the Ryerson health certificate, and then I will throw it just in the in the chat. Um, so there's a link and uh, you can print the form. You can see your doctor. Um, that uh, form is highly recommended because uh, the program directors are very familiar with them. Uh, you don't need to, uh, they, the form also describe what is your level, how the, the degree of incapacitation, if it was mild, if it was moderate or it was severe. So that, uh, it's important because we need to, well, the decision maker has to understand how um, that impacted uh, your ability to, to be successful and also these three points on foreseeing and beyond your control, right? So, and then the, and that information you are entitled just to keep, I mean, you always are entitled to, to keep your privacy about your mer medical condition. You don't need to disclose your medical condition, but what you need to disclose for them is just to, uh, for the program director to understand how your medical condition or the occurrence that happened beyond your control affected your academic performance. Because it can, we don't know if you have a, a, a doc, uh, if you submit a, a health certificate and doesn't explain that that, uh, uh, or it's not clear and the, there's a legal section for the doctor to complete. Uh, but if the section, there's not even a, in, any information when this happened, how the decision maker will know that this um, occurrence or incident, which was beyond your control, happen during the time of the final exam or the time that you needed to submit the assignment, which you were not able to do it because the unforeseen circumstances. So I think it's important just to give that information and then just to make uh, that your doctor make the connection between the incident and your condition so they can understand. And uh, you don't have to include that uh, medical certificate. We just recommend it because it's easy for everyone. It's easy for the program director because they're familiar too, uh, with that form. It's easy for the doctor because I mean they only need to just complete the, the lines, um, and it just requires less less time involved for the doctors. Uh, but it also, I mean, doesn't have to be a doctor as as soon as long as it's a health practitioner, you are fine. If you're uh, if you're dealing with a psychologist or psychiatric or a counselor or any other professional regulated professional uh, for health services you can include you can you can ask uh, that just to corroborate and if you need if you um, have more questions about uh, you don't you don't have that that uh, information or you don't know your doctor is away or something like that, just just contact us and and uh, any of us will have just to provide you more information about this this uh, how you can prove it but as i said we will we will talk more about evidence and supporting documents in the next slide and now i will pass pass it on to Lindo. Yeah, thanks. So procedural air grounds. This is um, if you believe that the university um, policy or regulation could be just from your program or department was not followed correctly. Um, and it's this had a negative impact on your academic performance. Um, so I have this example um, of a grade reassessment. Um, so there is a policy, Senate policy 162, that outlines um, what students should do if they believe there's a merit of work concern. Um, um, like if you believe that you got a grade that um, was inaccurate or inappropriate, um, basically students should know to look up this policy, which is sometimes not super obvious to students, but basically um, if uh, say you did follow all the steps outlined in policy 162, you put it in writing in an email, your rationale for why you believe that the assignment or, or test um, um, did satisfy um, the criteria in the directions or that you um, believe you did answer certain questions accurately and you're requesting a reassessment and say um, your professor just says, no, sorry, I'm not gonna do it. Um, or just ignores your email. Um, if they just, uh, just don't send a response, um, that could be 
claimed as a procedural error. Um, and then in your appeal, you would just have to outline very clearly what happened, like the dates, um, provide the emails to show that you did um, have that uh, correspondence with your professor, um, and you did follow through on your responsibilities from policy 162. Um, but unfortunately, the professor didn't uphold their um, side of the responsibilities, right? Um, so just be sure to cite the exact section of the policy that is relevant to your situation and just do your best to make it as clear as possible so that the reader understands like what you're, what you're saying. Um, procedural air grounds can be very strong if you kind of do um, that kind of clear description and, and citing of the policy um, that was violated. On to course management. Perfect. Thank you, Lindo. Uh, as Lindo mentioned before, course management could be uh, it could be for only grade appeals for undergraduate students or part time students, uh, and also it could be for graduate students now as well. So course management is when something in the course outline or evaluation structure was changed in a way that violated the policy 166, which is a course management policy, which ultimately caused your academic problems. Uh, th there could be some instances where no grade work, no graded work was received prior to the drop deadline, lack of feedback that would have helped for subsequent assignments and changes to the course outline that are now provided in writing. So uh, these are some instances where course management does uh, uh, fall under. I do see a lot of questions in the Q&A regarding the, um, the Wi-Fi issues and internet issues if uh, folks are in different countries and whatnot, and they're asking if this will be course management or extenuating circumstances. I, If I'm not mistaken, this would fall under extenuating circumstances as it is unforeseen. Um, uh, and uh, you can, it's beyond your control with the internet connections if you're elsewhere. And I'll pass it over to Jose for our next steps. Yes, thank you very, thank you very much, Suri. So I wanna send, um, just sending a message to everyone um, for the Ryzen Health Certificate. So the link is there, so you can uh, print, go to the link and print the, the form. Um, uh, again, once we cover now the uh, all the grounds for appeal, um, that's kind of the, one of the main things that you need to do, right? When you file an appeal, you must rely on the grounds of appeal. It can be one one ground of appeals, or can be it can even be multiple grounds for appeal. So once you you do that, uh, the next thing that you need to keep in mind, which is, uh, in my opinion, one one also. One of the most important things, I mean, everything is important, the, the, the three points that we wanna cover, but I guess um, I would say it is critical to have supporting documents because you can write your grants for appeal, all correct. You can explain what it is very well, very in a very chronological order, very concise. But then at the end, um, the decision makers say, well, everything is fine. The only thing is I will not grant your appeal because you, there was, there, there's no evidence that um, you were sick. I don't know, I mean, you, I don't know you were sick. I mean, everything's on trial, but I don't have any documents. I cannot do this. So the appeal will not be granted. And then you will need to work again with a further appeal and try to rectify that. To prevent that, we don't wanna, we want you to be successful uh, at the first level of appeal, which is the, the one that you, you will be working on, is that you ensure that you provide supporting relevant supporting documents um, to your ground for appeal. And um, again, it depends what kind of uh, ground for appeal it is, but for the external circumstances, uh, can be the, the, your doctor com can complete that form, the Ryerson health certificate, or if you have any uh, doctors, if you already have a doctor note or any other records, uh, just include it there. Um, and again, if you are not sure about, you know, about the supporting documents or there's any issues that you, you the doctor, you cannot get the document 
right now for whatever reason. I mean, doesn't have to be a doctor, let's say, if it's uh, external circumstances and then somebody um, uh, passes away and then you are unable to get the health certificate, or, sorry, the death certificate, uh, then um, you can you can talk to us. I mean, what we usually recommend to the students is like, okay, get a, a copy of the visually or visually or get or try to get a, um, any other record, you know, even uh, that you can go and print through the internet. Uh, or if for um, in some cases, um, I seen that there's like remote communities or the government is backlog and they are unable to get the, the, the certificate right away. Uh, so just kind of explain when you can get it. Uh, or any, it depends on the circumstance. It depends what kind of uh, external circumstances is. But I would say you need to prove uh, whatever ground it is. You need to prove your your case. Um, and again, if you are not sure about the documents um, uh, that you can include or they are not available, just just talk to us, and we will be uh, help, more than happy just to just to help you with that. And next slide is. Okay, I think that. Okay. Um, so just about um, the formal appeal. So it's basically for any students um, that have grounds um, and are not able to resolve their issue informally. So it like basically you have the right to file an appeal if um, you disagree with your final grade or your academic standing and you really should um, be able to, you know, explain what your grounds of appeal are. The first level of appeals, which you probably all would be at at this point in time, is the department or school level of appeal. Um, and just be aware that um, your appeal submission should include a written statement. We used to call it an appeal letter um, when appeals were filed on paper um, to physical departments. Um, and so, yeah, you might see statement letter used interchangeable, interchangeably anyway, but basically um, your statement is gonna be your explanations, your, your reasoning for why you're appealing. And that's gonna be entered into the text boxes that exist in the online submission portal, um, which we're gonna get to soon. Um, and uh, you do really need to try to gather supporting documentation. So just brainstorm and think carefully about what um, supporting documents you can include. On to Zoli. Perfect, thank you. So I'll be talking about the online submission. Uh, so now Ryerson has moved everything for all students, graduate, undergraduate, all students to online appeal submissions. Uh, these are the two websites where you could uh, go and submit your appeals. Uh, I'll walk you folks through the process as well. So if you go uh, to this link, something on the right will show up like that and you will click submit submit your appeal online. And then I'll walk you folks to the next uh, steps. Uh, so when you're doing it, when you go onto the Senate website, just click on appeals, click. Uh, if you folks click on online application, submit your appeal online, it will redirect you to your Ryzen login page where you put in your Ryzen email or uh, username and login. And then you folks will be directed to this page where you say start a new appeal. And then in the next step, it will just talk about uh, the term uh, which you're applying, uh, appealing for, which is going to be the winter 2021 uh, term. And you uh, basically click uh, affected academic career, uh, which will be your undergraduate or graduate if you are a graduate student. And you could only, uh, you could have multiple grade and standing appeal kind of thing. Uh, so if you're doing a grade appeal here, you will have to submit another one for a standing appeal. Uh, and then you could have more than one grounds for appeal. Uh, on the right, you see some questions and uh, question and a text box where you have to answer those questions, which my colleagues will walk you through how to answer those questions truly and uh, in detail. 
and then uploading documents. Uh, so they're really picky about uh, how to uh, name your documents. Uh, so when submitting a document, if it's a, a health certificate, uh, write health certificate slash your initials. If it's evidence one or evidence two, do evidence one slash your uh, initials. Uh, so have all the documents uh, uploaded here and uh, just uh, if read through policy 168 before submitting uh, um, before submitting this appeal and then you just submit and uh, we'll go from there. And I'll pass it over to Carolina to talk about the appeal statement. Hi, um, so just to go over um, the appeal statement and what you should um, just some things to remember about it. So um, your statement is really your chance to explain the situation as you see it in detail um, and how it has impacted your academics. Um, so this is without interruption <laughs> to um, to really share your um, your perspective um, and, you know, just have it on paper for people to read. We did have some questions about the amount of detail that's required. Um, and I just really want to highlight, I think Jose and Zilli have touched on this as well, that um, you know, you aren't required to share any um, specific information um, or anything like that. Um, you know, if something is really personal or really challenging for you to talk about, um, you know, don't feel like you have to disclose it. Um, really just, um, really just kind of, um, you know, suss it out yourself and do what works best for you. Um, but sharing your personal perspective about how issues um, unfolded can really help the decision makers kind of um, see the personal side of that. Um, so those are just some important things to remember um, moving forward. So um, I will pass it on to the next person. Which is me. So about writing your appeal statement. Um, so first of all, that first text box that you're going to have to um, answer or write in your explanation, you need to address um, what went wrong, what um, your grounds of appeal are. So provide a little bit of the context um, and absolutely say like if it is extenuating circumstances grounds or course management grounds or procedural error or prejudice, whichever applies to you, say that straight away, but then go into a little, well, whatever you feel is necessary to clearly explain um, what happened. And like dates, dates are really helpful. Just to, and if you can go in chronological order a little bit, it's very, very helpful to the reader and the person trying to make a decision on your appeal. Okay, over to Zully. Yeah, just to add on to what Lindell said, uh, writing everything down in chronological order, this does help uh, the person making the decision get a clear understanding as well. Be as specific as possible and refer to the sporting documentation like evidence that you're providing. So in chronological order, you could say, uh, the first thing I did was I went to the doctor, got a rise and medical certificate. I emailed the instructor, did not get a response. And then lastly, I emailed the director and did not get a response to there as well. Just follow a timeline of events kind of thing uh, so in order. So uh, be specific as possible when explaining uh, the actions you took. Yes, uh, just to, to add on and just to recap. So transfer appeal and, and there is, you have your statement, transfer appeal, and then uh, you, you will cover the evidence and then you also you will make sure you will explain the what happened the facts and then this aspect as we just mentioned right the actions you took um, before and after the incident also is very important because you can have a good argument you can have still your evidence but then the appeal uh, may be denied because the prone director said well uh, you were responsible just to um, to let us know that you were you have a, a incident you never let us know you never contact anyone it's already been a month uh you this is the first time that we heard from you have you uh tried to uh, you know uh, resolve the issue 
well, uh, I think they will just kind of see what kind of actions you took. And I mean, you can just talk about, remember at the beginning we say, well, uh, informal resolution. So we just try to see um, contact that you can say, yes, I approached the, the instructor, the pro instructor was unable to, uh, unable or unwilling to help me. And then later on, I email uh, the program director, but again, the program director um, was, uh, he said that because the grade was already um, uh, published that I need to go to RAMS. I included these emails here for your reference. And then I did mention in the beginning when I approached the instructor, you can see the email thread that I was uh, hospitalized for, uh, for uh, three weeks. So I was not able uh, to, um, to communicate uh, within the three business days that the policy requires. So, but then as soon as I, I was able, I, I was, uh, uh, it took me an extra week after I recovered just to get the health certificate. And by that time, the grade already was, the final grade was released. So here is some information uh, from, the, from the doctors and there's some dates. If you require more uh, information or clarification, please don't hesitate to contact me. So I think it's very important that you cover, you know, the steps, you know, relate to the incident before what you did before and after. So again, that it will give you, uh, uh, that will increase your possibility to be successful in the appeal one day because they will be looking, um, uh, they are considered that, that, that there is the expectation in the policy that you need to try to resolve the, the matter that you need to, uh, if there's incidents, you need to communicate with the three business days. That doesn't happen, you explain why it didn't happen and, and that's fine. I mean, that's, that's why we wanna, I include that section. Okay, so now we pass it on to Lindo. Oh, sorry, uh, to, Carli to Carlina, sorry. Yeah, oh, no worries. Um, so yeah, just a few more um, kind of tips and tricks on what you should include when you're writing a standing appeal is just really take the opportunity to explain what you will do to ensure that the past difficulties will no longer affect you. So, you know, if you've had issues, um, you know, be that extenuating circumstances or, or whatever, um, what steps are you going to take to prevent the same issues from continuing on in the future? And that can mean anything from reaching out to, um, you know, academic accommodation services or um, seeking out counseling or getting a writing tutor or, or really anything. Um, just make sure that it addresses um, kind of the main issues that you, um, that you bring forward in your letter and really shows that you're able to, um, you know, to move forward and continue to succeed in your program, because that's all they're really looking for is that um, you're going to be able to succeed. So um, any way that you can highlight that, make a learning plan or a strategy, um, those would all be really beneficial. Um, and then also uh, explain why this is the right program for you. Why is this your dream career? Why, why do you see yourself in this role in the future? And why is it integral that you continue on in this program at Ryerson, really highlight those things. Um, and that'll really help them show like how important this program really is to you, how important Ryerson is to you. So those are all really important things to note. Um, also discuss how being RTW or PPW would impact you. Um, that in can include like financial issues, mental health issues. Of course, we're all in um, a pandemic. So we are all feeling very isolated. Um, all of those things might be relevant to bring up. And then um, lastly, explain why you think the department should give you another chance to succeed. And that kind of ties back into kind of your next steps forward. But you really want to give the department and the decision makers, you know, every opportunity in order to read through and be like, this person needs another chance. So if you can just explain like why, um, like what happened, why it was outside of your control and um, how you're going to move forward in order to, um, to succeed in the future. And those are all really important things to highlight in your letter. And um, yeah, so I'm going to pass it on to Lyndall for remedies. Okay, so remedies, they're very important. You know, um, sometimes uh, I think students forget that like, um, you know, you have to put forward a remedy, like they are uh, maybe more um, kind of uh, cognizant, like aware of the fact that they 
need to appeal. They disagree with their grade, but then they're like, whoa, I have to think of a way to resolve this issue. Okay. It's, it's, but it's really practical, right? When you think about it. So your appeal um, has to include what you think is um, an appropriate way to solve the problem that you experience. And so like reflect back on your situation um, and think about like, if you did miss uh, that midterm, um, like it would make sense to ask maybe for the opportunity to write that mid midterm, right? Um, and be aware that remedies cannot violate uh, Ryerson policies. And here are some examples of um, some good solutions and some bad solutions. Um, so um, a chance to write um, or potentially rewrite um, a final exam or an earlier test that you missed for um, extenuating circumstances, if that's your grounds. Um, and you can ask for a regrade or reassessment um, of um, whichever assignment in question. It's just a little tricky sometimes with reassessment or regrades in that you probably should address um, like maybe if it was an earlier assignment, why you did not um, ask for a reassessment within the 10 business days that is stipulated in policy 162, the grade reassessment and recalculation policy. So just be aware of that. But maybe it's just related to something that was due at the very end of the semester. And in that case, you may be still within that like kind of time frame, and it can still be worthwhile asking for that type of remedy. Um, and uh, a retroactive course withdrawal or course drop. Um, so that is a remedy that actually has a rather high threshold. So um, some of you might be aware that there is a process at Ryerson to request retroactive withdrawals or a late, late uh, course withdrawal. Um, and that is uh, administered through the registrar's office at the university. Um, and it's texting on today, but be aware that like you can, um, if it applies to you, um, use the appeal process to request a retroactive withdrawal. And that can be really to your advantage to use the appeal option because um, there's more recourse. It's kind of a safer path to choose um, because in the worst case scenario, if you end up being denied, there are the faculty level of appeal. And then if necessary, that final level of appeal to the Senate Appeal Committee, um, where you can try to kind of reframe and maybe add in your additional supporting documents and really clarify um, like why it is that you believe that it would be appropriate to be granted a retroactive withdrawal. And so to clarify what it is, it's actually um, that uh, the registrar's office would make the final decision um, if it, your appeal is granted to remove your enrollment from that course or multiple courses from say the last semester. Um, and this is really kind of for those of you that might have been incapacitated um, for maybe a substantial part of the semester and you missed like multiple assignments um, and you just missed the opportunity to drop the course. Right. And with um, those type of scenarios, really focus in on like why and like the timeline of why you missed the deadline to drop the course, which from last semester, winter 2021, was April 16th, I believe, that Friday. Um, so um, really just uh, be careful. And, and that may be a really good solution for you. Um, just know that you should be kind of thorough with um, detailing everything and have your supporting documentation. Um, the registrar's office is strict about um, basically like uh, adjusting and um, removing courses from students' academic records from their transcripts because they're very, very um, serious documents that um, are audited sometimes by the government. So um, they just take it very, very seriously. Um, okay, so a lot on <laughs> retroactive withdrawals. But then um, another good remedy is if you're doing a standing appeal is to ask to return to your program on a probationary 
um, contract on probationary standing, especially if you have a GPA issue that you've maybe been dealing with over a couple of semesters. Um, and I think it's on the next slide. I think if it's still me. Oh, I haven't talked about the bad solutions. <laughs> um, the bad, the bad remedies. Um, you can't just ask for um, a grade bump. You can't just ask for um, an A plus. Um, um, grades at Ryerson need to be earned. Um, so you would have to really explain like why you deserve um, um, a reassessment probably on your work um, if you were given a grade that you just feel is really wrong. Um, yeah, and then another bad example of a remedy is um, asking for a regrade on an assignment um, that was completed before your um, incident occurred, for example. Like if you unfortunately were in a car accident or were unwell at a period of time, maybe early in the semester, um, or no, actually the other way around in the example, we'll do it this way, but like maybe it was um, at the end of the semester where you were in a car accident, something happened, um, but you actually want to redo your midterm that happened like in February, but your incident was like not until March. So that wouldn't really make sense. Do you see what I mean? Um, Okay, and then on to the next slide here. So just to clarify again, for a grade appeal, be aware that your remedy is supposed to be specific to that course that you're appealing the grade for. Um, and then for standing appeals, uh, for example, if you're PPW um, for failing a required course the third time, you can, um, you can ask for a fourth attempt to take that course. Um, you can, or if you're in nursing, it would be a third attempt at whichever required course. Um, and you would normally ask to be able to return to your program on a probationary contract, just because that shows that, you know, you're kind of reasonably thinking of how to get back on track and aim to be back at a clear standing to go on to graduate from your program. Okay, so. On to Zoli, I think is the slide. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, so I'll be just talking about uh, when submitting any documentation, just be honest throughout the whole process. We tell our students to be honest, provide uh, legitimate documentations, uh, because if you if there is a false statement, false document uh, that you provide, you can get charged with academic misconduct which uh, where in a result, there will be disciplinary action taking place. So uh, there could be one term to two years suspension. So do not falsify any documentation. If there's an error on a medical note that you got, please do go back to the doctor and uh, the doctor's office. Uh, please do tell them to uh, make the changes and restamp it. Do not make the changes yourself, even if it's outside of like school and you uh, submit falsified documentation, there could be uh, serious consequences taking place. So just like uh, uh, outside world in the school world, uh, do not falsify any documentation, the school does verify your documentation with the appropriate parties. So we do not want you getting in any further trouble or going to any other hurdles. So do not be honest throughout the whole process and do not submit falsified uh, uh, documentations. Be honest the whole time. And I'll just pass it over to Jose. Yes, thank, thank you, Suli. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We agree com completely with you, even a minor alteration, even with permission. Even the doctor said, okay, no, I promise you have me permission. We have seen problems with that. Anyways, but you, the, the point came across and thank you for, for explaining that, Suli. Okay, so uh, moving forward now, now that you have received all the information, I'm sure that it's just like, you feel again, overwhelmed and okay, what should I do? Okay, the first thing that you need to do is, um, um, grab a piece of paper, try to create your, uh, your first draft. Doesn't have to be perfect and it will not be perfect at the first time that you draft. Um, you have two options. One is you can look at the appeal information package, either from CSER or from the RSU. There are some templates there, either if you wanna uh, prepare your statement for your grade or your standing appeal. 
um, look at those templates. You can just work, you know, from from either of those, or you can start in a blank piece of paper and then uh, start just uh, doing some brainstorming and start with the points that we covered in the slides. Um, identify your grounds for appeal. Have a strong skeleton, and then uh, talk once you. Uh, identify the ground or the grounds for appeal, then um, work on uh, explaining what happened with that ground to appeal, all the relevant information about that ground to appeal. Do bullet points and try to keep the sequence. Don't try at first just to write in long sentences. Um, once you complete your bullet points, then just talk, um, do another section for the steps that you took uh, before and after the incident. And if this is also a standing appeal, as Kalina indicated, just try to uh, try to write a section when you provide your okay, the steps that you will take to succeed. How this uh, under that category do bullet points? Why this? Uh, what happened in the past with your academic standing? It will not happen now. Talk about the, the system that you have that you didn't have before or how and, and present, I mean, be passionate about your, your, your program, explain about the impact. Again, this is if it's uh, academic standing and propose concrete solutions why uh, you already have a system, right? Um, and then um, describe your evidence. I mean, probably make another uh, um, heading and then bullet points and describe your, your, your evidence. And then the last thing, the most important thing that you want once you explain that you can just come with a brief conclusion or you can just um uh, and then later on you can talk about the remedy uh, linda linda already explained what it will be a fair and appropriate remedy so make sure that you uh, the remedy that you are asking makes sense so that should be everything and um if you don't try to get it perfect the first time draft it complete the first draft even if you do the brainstorm if you have a strong skeleton and then the next step i guess is just try to clean it make it if you can just kind of elaborate more on, on your bullet points try to make things in chronological order then work on your headings uh and then uh the next time that you are take a break continue on the draft um again revise revise your your sentence just create make full sentences and then once that everything seems to complete um, clean it and then have somebody, a friend or family member just to read it and to say, okay, do you understand this? If your family or friend uh, understand what's going on, that's a good draft. <laughs> if they just really, uh, and you can ask questions, okay, what is my issue? What am I asking? Do you, what do you think? Do you think that it, do you think that it, uh, it, it makes sense? Do you think that it will be granted? Just, just a general personal opinion, right? And then, I mean, the, the thing is, that somebody understand why they, I mean, I just want to make sure that when somebody read it, somebody has no clue what's going on, they are able to understand, follow your reading and identify your concern. So once you feel like everything is good, I mean, you can just file it, you can consult with us if it's the final draft. Uh, um, and then we can just say, okay, sure. If there's anything that we pick up, um, we, we will let you know. If not, just go ahead and, and, and file it. But don't expect just to be perfect at the first time. Um, Take your time. Uh, the deadline is approaching. Uh, get started today. Uh, work a little bit, you know, an hour, two hours if you can. Then take a break. And then if you can, again, another, another hour in the evening. Tomorrow, another hour. Saturday, if you want another hour. Um, but just uh, space it out so some feel that it's, it's too much. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess uh, that's, that's, that's the thing. You want to put the time and energy. energy. If you don't put the time and energy, believe me, then it will be more work. It will be more frustrating. You need to just uh, have put it in order to be successful and, and, and to have a better chances for increase, you need to put the time because it's like an essay, right? If you write a paper that you can write good at the first time and then it requires revisions. And then the more effort and time that you put, the better mark you will have. So here, our goal is that your appeal is granted. So uh, what you want to do is you want to put the time that you cover all the requirements that we that we included or that we discussed in this in this workshop, um, and then your chances they will increase, and then that will avoid time, and that will if you make it easier for the program directors to understand the issue, it will be easier also uh, for them to understand what is your concern, and again that will result into 
have a better chance uh, to succeed in, in your appeal. So we are here for you and just uh, don't get uh, overwhelmed, but get started today. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so you've finished your appeal. You've spent an hour to two hours every day from now until Monday as Jose um, recommended and you've submitted your appeal. What's next? So many of you likely have the question, what happens if I'm denied? Well, there are three levels um, to which you can appeal um, for standing or grades. So it's not just like this first letter that you send off is make or break it. If you believe that a decision was unfair or didn't um, take proper consideration, um, then you can then um, appeal it. So your first level is either your department or your school level appeal. Likely that's what most of you are planning on submitting um, by Tuesday. Um, if that is unsuccessful, then you can appeal to the faculty. And then if that is unsuccessful, then you can appeal to the Senate. Um, now the Senate level is the final level within Ryerson that you can appeal to. Um, and it's also not guaranteed that you'll have the opportunity to have a, a hearing at the Senate level. There's a number of, um, of grounds that you need to um, meet in order to be able to receive a Senate hearing. So if you're in a position um, in the next month or two where you feel like you're going to need to appeal to the faculty or to the Senate, please reach out to any of us and we can offer you more precise um, examples and a better idea of what grounds you need to meet for each one of those levels. Um, so you'll have 10 business days to dis to 10 business days to submit your appeal after each level. So when you receive the decision, you have 10 business days to appeal. Um, and the grounds for appeal must be consistent throughout the different levels. So you can't just say like one thing in your um, departmental appeal and then a completely different reason in your faculty appeal. It needs to be consistent. Um, and which is also why it's very important that you that you tell the truth and are completely honest because you don't want to have to be pivoting halfway through um, because you were being disingenuous or dishonest in your first appeal. Um, and there may be a hearing at the Senate, Senate level where a binding decision is made. Um, so again, if you find yourself getting towards the Senate appeal, please reach out to us and we can offer you some more concrete and specific advice on how to submit an appeal letter. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to Lyndall. Okay, so if you are hesitant to appeal, if you feel maybe kind of nervous or intimidated by it, just think, do I have valid grounds for, for appealing um, this grade from a course or my academic standing? And if so, if, if yes, um, I think you should go for it. <laughs> It can be very useful. It can help to correct the issue. Um, and it just takes some time and some effort. Um, and it can take some brainstorming to just, you know, think critically, like, how am I going to substantiate um, what happened? And like, uh, like logistically, maybe gathering the evidence that you would need to have a strong appeal. Um, but it can really save yourself potentially of having to redo a course or from being removed from your program. Um, so it, it can be really, really important and really uh, helpful. Um, and you should not face any reprisal um, if you're uh, respectful in what you're submitting and what you're putting forward, um, if you're, even if you're honest, right? Um, uh, there should be no harm in that sense. And just be reminded that um, decision makers are academics. Um, they should be professional. They should be objective in, in considering your appeal. Um, and yeah, it, they, they should not, um, you know, have a change of uh, perception about you um, and there really shouldn't be any uh, negative consequences in that way. Um, and yeah, it can work out. We're here to help you. Um, so we encourage you to file your appeal. It is your right as a student to be able to appeal your final grades or your academic standing. Um, so um, feel, feel good about it. Um, 
it's, it can be a challenge, but, uh, but go for it. It could be a learning experience too. So here's some other resources. I think Zelly is gonna talk about these. Yes, thank you, Lindo. Um, yeah, some other resources that you could reach out to on campus. Uh, everyone is working virtually, so your best bet might be uh, uh, from home. So your best bet might be just to get in contact with them through email. Uh, we recommend uh, students to get um, uh, rising counseling services if you do require it. And uh, these folks are uh, professionally trained and they might be able to assist you to the best of ways as well. And I will also link in uh, other directly and student resources in the chat box here. Um, let me just give me a sec. And uh, this is some academic service at registrar's office. Uh, if you have any money matter uh, learning assistance, uh, please feel free to check out that link provided. Um, and um, yeah, also there is uh, academic accommodations where you folks could reach out to and fresh start. If uh, you were present at yesterday's meeting and last week's uh, for grade and standing appeals, uh, uh, Chris uh, Bentram was uh, there from Fresh Start, and yeah, uh, if you uh, do need Fresh Start, please do reach out to Chris if you need, uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, regarding Fresh Start, uh, do reach out to Chris as well. Uh, and then Aaron was here earlier as well uh, from Human Rights Office. Uh, if you do have any conflicts uh, uh, regarding human rights issues at Ryerson that you feel are being violated and you need the Human Rights Office to look into it, please do reach out to them as well. I'll pass it over to, I believe it is That's Jose. Me. Thank you, Suli. Yes, as you, as you indicated in the link <clears throat> that you sent there, yes, if, if in addition to the appeals, keep in mind those resources and that link because that link also provide you um, valuable information if you have issues, uh, as Sully indicated, with money matters or learning assistance, academic services, uh, register office, accommodations for disability, computing services, career services, co-op, a personal safety, a crisis and intervention, health and wellness, counseling, legal advice, connecting with another students, students' events, uh, leader, leadership experience, food at Ryerson, uh, student ID, uh, housing and parking. So you check it out, the, web, the website. Um, and the last slide here uh, is my uh, email address. And I think at the beginning of the chat, you can find also Carolina, and Suli uh, uh, email address. Um, that's the preferred way of communication by email. Um, I believe also at the beginning of the chat, I included uh, the link if you wanna book an appointment with the RSU uh, team. Uh, so what I will include it again here for everyone, for your convenience, just give me one second. So if there are no more spots, just send us an email. And then uh, typically with that link, you can book an appointment with us. Um, if you, for some reason, go to the link and there's no more available uh, appointments available, send us an email and we will sure just, just to book manually for you. Um, okay, and then my email is there. You have Carlina and Sulis, and then you have also Lindo's email if you need to contact her send her an email. Uh, we, again, we all prefer email rather than phone uh, uh, communications. Um, we are working remotely and that will be the easy way. It's just uh, uh, our preferred way of communication, just email. Uh, keep in mind also the office of, of the ombudsperson. Um, uh, Kwame Ado is our ombudsperson and he has two people, two individuals working with him. So if you have uh, any questions uh, and you need assistance with issues of fairness, uh, they are great in, in, their, in the office of the ombudsperson, so they can be a good resource from you, especially again, if there's any issues you feel, you feel like probably this, not, this is not a human rights, but there's also something that it was unfair, either you know, during the, the, the uh, throughout, this, throughout the time that you're at school, 
or even after the appeal process, but I mean, they are considered the, the office of the last resource. Um, I don't wanna, I guess for now, for your appeal purposes, let's wanna make sure that you write a strong appeal. So that will be the best thing. Uh, you don't wanna use, utilize resources unless you have to. Uh, but again, if they, through the process, through the appeal process, if you ever experienced something that it was unfair, such as, you know, the decision make, you put the evidence and um, you didn't, um, you didn't, um, uh, didn't consider the evidence. I mean, you can just go through appeal, but at the end, if you feel there was any other concerns, you can talk to us or you can talk to, to GAMI. And the last people there is the Senate office. So you can, um, you can talk to, you can send an email or you can contact Vicky Madsen or Donna Bell. The email address is there, the bell. Uh, this one is especially if you have any issues, uh, if you need resources or you need to identify policy or uh, if you have any issue when you submit your online appeal, let's say for if there's any glitch, a technical glitch, a computer or something, the software, you know, the internet, the link is broken or you submit it and there's an error, just a screenshot it, send them an email and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, Don, uh, Ms. Donabel, I tried to file the appeal on this day, didn't go, the link wasn't working, I attached a, um, a screenshot with this, met, with this error message, uh, will you be able just to help me or you want me to send you the appeal via email? And then she will just give you the direction, right? But it is important if there's any issue that you uh, have uh, information and provide it to them. So again, thank you very much uh, for attending uh, this workshop. I think that you, after this workshop, you feel a little bit more, uh, well, less stress and, uh, and especially with more direction on, on what you have to do and what, what you will be expecting or what it will be the goal just when you write a strong appeal. Again, by having a strong appeal, your chances uh, uh, to succeed and in in, 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 in your appeal will increase. Keep in mind everything that we included, the evidence, the steps that you took before and after to choose the ground for appeal. And more importantly, complying with the deadline. The deadline is strict. Uh, it's next Tuesday by uh, May 25th, by four o'clock. For some reason, you know, you are unable to, to fulfill the deadline. Uh, you foresee that because medical reasons or family issues or medical condition or, or contact your program director via email and ask for an extension, provide why you need to explain the extension, um, suggest what is the time that you need, if you need three days, four days, five days, and provide some uh, documents, right? Or some um, uh, back, uh, some support for you just to ask for the extension. Uh, and unless you receive the written confirmation, you are expected to file by Tuesday. If you receive it before and write and say, not a problem, you're, you're safe. But if you don't have the response, you're expected to file on the 25th, again, so take, just keep, keep that in mind. Um, if you don't receive your, um, I mean, more, I'm, I'm pretty much everyone received the, their, their grade by, by now, but sometimes there are exceptions. And if you haven't received your final grade in RAMS, or it's not, it's not, it, I mean, it's not published uh, officially there, then you will have 10 business days from the day that you receive the grade. Let's say I receive, uh, it's May 25th, my grade, my final grade is not, not received. Then on June the 2nd, I receive an email and say, Ukraine is, really, is already published in RAMS. Then from the day that I, that I receive the notification and my registration email, then you will count 10 business days and that will be your deadline to, to file your appeal. So keep that in mind. And again, whatever we can do to help you, uh, we are here uh, for you or sir, we are completely independent uh, from the unions from the university. Uh, um, uh, we are funded with, by levies with students' uh, fees. And yeah, so I guess uh, for now, we want to move um, uh, to questions and, and yeah. So thank you, everyone. Just for